architects, like lawyers, can be very singularly focused and decide that their whole life's mission is to design, but there's a lot more involved in running a business than, than sitting at a computer, sitting at a drafting table, and designing. Episode 108. This is The Business of Architecture. Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where each week I speak with a successful architect, designer, or consultant to discuss tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. Today's show is sponsored by BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the office and project management software built with the needs of architects in mind. And for a limited time, startup firms can get two free seats of ArchiOffice for a year. Go check it out at ArchiOffice.com. When you speak to the folks over at BQE Software, please mention this show. Because when you use ArchiOffice, you support Business of Architecture, which allows me to continue bringing you this content. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is Enoch Bartlett-Sears, and I'm glad to everyone welcome you back today to the show. Today, I'm really excited because we're going to dive into business entity formation for architects. This is awesome. This is a field that's totally foreign to me. Uh, if you're anything like me, then you're, you know, not not a lawyer, not an attorney. Uh, today, I have one of the world's foremost authorities on business entity formation for architecture firms, Patty Harris. Uh, previously, she spent 13 years as the managing partner of a New York City-based construction law firm. And in addition to overseeing the business operations of the firm, she advised clients on office and business management issues. So Patty's also written and spoken extensively on entity formation for design firms. I'm excited to have Patty on the show today because she has a strong background and experience in business, which is awesome in terms of managing and running a business, but also in the entity and business formation for architects, which is what we're going to talk about today. So Patty, welcome to the show. Thank you, Enoch. First of all, tell us a little bit about your background. This is a really interesting combination to have a law degree and an MBA and to have that experience as a lawyer. How did all this come about? So I guess my theme song is Take It As It Comes. And I like to talk, so I thought I wanted to be a lawyer. Went to law school. Um, didn't really understand law school, to be truthful, but came out and uh, joined a mergers and acquisitions firm. And um, I found there that while I thought I would be putting transactions together, in fact, um, lawyers are instructed on what to do by the finance guys. So I said to myself, I'm going to go back to business school and become a finance guy. And I get to business school and lo and behold, I joined the Church of Entrepreneurship, which was sort of a new thing back in the mid 90s when I was in business school. Uh, but I came out and founded my first of three businesses, and I'm now in the process of finding my third, which you alluded to, Licensure. It is a firm that helps architects and engineers with business formation and licensing. After business school, I ran my first business for quite some time, and one of my assignments was uh, brought me to Zetlin and DeChiara, this New York City construction law law firm. And it was a billing and bookkeeping problem, not, not unusual at all in any kind of professional service business. Uh, and I was here for a three-month tenure, but while I was here, we all fell in love, and they asked me to become managing partner and work on the business um, of the firm. And I took that role for 13 years. And because what the firm does is so, so narrow, representing primarily design professionals, in everything from contract negotiation through litigation and dispute resolution, I couldn't help but permeate construction um, and design and building. Uh, I was the first guinea pig at the firm to sit for the lead exam and got my lead AP and went in described to the partners and it really wasn't all that hard. It was brute memorization, just like the bar exam. <laughs> um, but I look out the windows here uh, in the middle of Manhattan and I see so many projects that are built by our clients, um, as well as a couple of litigations, but we don't have to get into those. Uh, so that, that was my journey in a nutshell. Um, while, I, while I was here, uh, I see the law, law firm profession and how we deliver legal services changing rapidly. 
And I think that Zetlin and Dechiara does too. And there are certain types of functions like business formation. It just doesn't make sense any longer for lawyers to bill hourly. It becomes too expensive for a process that shouldn't be expensive. And that was how I started to get the seeds for the new business. So I'm being incubated by the firm, but here I am. Wonderful. And what what great what a <laughs> <laughs> what a great topic to talk about. Patty, you said something there at the end that I'd like to dive into a little bit when you talked about the uh the environment for practicing law changing and the way that services are being delivered and perceived changing. Let's dig into that a little bit. What did you mean by that? Can you tell me more about how that's changing? I can, and I speak in particular with architects about this issue a lot. Um there have been certain dips in our economy, certainly this most recent Great Recession in 2008, where the power really, if it didn't always belong to the buyer, very, very much belongs to the buyer. And the law profession has heard for, gosh, I'm going to say close to two decades, that our clients don't want to pay billable hour rates any longer. And unfortunately, lawyers are very <laughs> difficult to change and not typically known as innovators. So we've hung tight to that billable hour. And I would say about 10 or 15 years ago, um, we started getting noise that, that some of our clients wanted electronic billing and that we would be using task codes in that electronic billing. And what they've been doing now is accumulating data so that and it's starting, a client can call you and say, I know when you have a litigation that looks like this, it's going to take you five hours to, to draft an answer to a complaint. So I'm going to pay you five hours and you're going to accept that or else I'm going to go to the law firm next door and get them to do it. So I think that clients are starting to move into cost containment. And I think that architects share that stress and burden with lawyers and have certainly for the last five or six or seven years, where it's a buyer's market, and there are a lot of hungry architects, as there are a lot of hungry lawyers, and you start to price out of fear um, that you know if you don't if you don't accede to the client's wishes, uh, you know the guy next door may get the job. So I think that's something the law firm has the law firm world and the architecture world tend to share. I know architects don't tend to bill by hour, but I think they face the same sorts of pressures. Absolutely. I mean, this feels like a really good heart to heart. It feels like I'm talking to a colleague because <laughs> I'm like, I understand. <laughs> so Well, I could do you want can I just rant a little bit more yeah, about yeah. architects? Yeah, tell me more. Tell me more, please. Okay. So one thing is I think that architects and I'm generalizing, tend to undervalue the service they provide. And I think that owners are really, really good at, at bullying them. And I'm not sure it necessarily has to be that way. And I'm, I'm certainly not talking about the name architects. I'm talking about the profession in general. And a specific example uh, was a, recently I was with a group of architects and I'm sure you're familiar with the integrated delivery uh, IDP process um, that's sort of become a vogue, certainly in California to some degree. And while here on the East Coast, our, I can't say that our clients are doing this IDP. We do IDP behaviorally and IDP light where everybody, the architect, the, con the constructor, the owner, everybody gets in the room at the beginning of the project and manages the project together from beginning to completion. And the idea with that is there are a lot less change orders in the, in the job and there are, the time of, to complete the job tends to be closer to what it ought to be. So I was chatting with a, a group of architects who were doing this IDP light and they said, oh, you know, we're doing jobs where there's a guy on the project site every single day and things are much smoother and things are much faster and this is just really great. And I said, well, if you have a guy on the job every day, and that's not the traditional role of the architect, I just have two kind of questions and comments. One is I want you to know that you're taking on additional potential liability because when the job foreman comes over to your architect employee and says, hey, listen, <laughs> should I send, move this thing two inches over? You're opening yourself up to blame for some kind of construction failure. 
But the mm-hmm. second thing is, you know, you, you now have a role you didn't have before. So I assume you're getting paid. And suddenly I have 12 guys in front of me going, oh, no, we didn't ask for any more pay. We can't ask for more pay. And I'm thinking, you know, this is so <laughs> architecty to me. <laughs> ask for more pay. Oh, I love it. But, I mean, and I think that's something we learn as lawyers as we begin to negotiate things. If you smell blood, you're just going to bully someone and take advantage of it. And, you know, as an architect, exude confidence in what you do and tell them this is your price. It's, you're going to lose jobs much, much less often than you think. And I think ultimately make more, be paid more for them. So lawyers don't have that problem. <laughs> that, they, that they're willing to sort of state what they believe they're worth. And so on, but even more, even more than the engineers, I think the architects tend to be the first ones to kind of take the hit financially. Very, very interesting, interesting insight. So, <laughs> so maybe we have this confluence of of technology, of economic pressures that are sort of converging at the same time, right, yes. and affecting our professions. You talked about how these new electronic billing procedures allow the client to get even more of an upper hand in terms of demanding certain things from the clients. So at least in your profession, how are things, how are firms reacting to that? You're seeing some solutions to that. How, and you hinted at it when you said that your business is set up with the premise that our, um, lawyers don't need to bill for everything. So maybe take us down that journey a little bit. Maybe that'll stir our minds as architects to figure out how we can improve our businesses by listening to you, Patty, share what you're seeing. So there's a great book called The Death of Lawyers or The End of Lawyers written by a technologist out of the UK who's also a lawyer. And he's been talking for two decades at least about how um, technology is supplanting traditional legal skills to some degree. So everything from if I'm asked to do a contract, the client is not naive. They know I've got the contract on the system. It's not like I'm you know, redrafting it paragraph by paragraph to um, where we now in in our profession, if all parties agree in the litigation, you can essentially agree on code words. And instead of physical human beings uh, reviewing mounds and mounds and mounds of documents, the computers will only pull up those documents with those key code words in them. So, you know, a computer's doing it, you're not paying hourly lawyer fees um and that is a huge a a huge thing for the profession for us to begin to trust sort of computer brains to do what we have traditionally done but it's a lot faster and a lot cheaper and particularly in construction litigation which tends to be very very document intensive Um, so what that that's one way we directly see that we're expected to use technology and how we practice But I think the other thing you see is a lot of people starting to stomp on traditional law firm turf. And so my business, uh, my business is very much like a legal Zoom, but it's but it's focused on A&E. You take a legal Zoom, you take um, what used to be the copy shops. They are now electronic discovery consultants or something. All of these other vendors are coming in and pouncing on lawyers refusal to somehow move the prices so what law firms are starting to see is that you need to carve out each piece of what you do and maybe discovery is done by a computer and maybe business formations are done by a vendor instead of using legal time so you you can't say, oh, litigation just walked in the door. It's more, it's, it's better to say, well, there are five or six or seven pieces in this litigation. What is it really important for us to do as expensive lawyers? And what can we safely farm out that will make the client happy and, um, you know, and keep the price down? I think architects see it with BIM. You know, is it cheaper to get a BIM model from a vendor or to do it in-house, for example, uh, the larger firms, you know, that's the question. But but I think that design professionals see the same thing, that there are pieces of what they do that maybe can be done less expensively, and the clients are not naive to that. They, they expect you to be seeking out solutions. 
You know, one of the things that intrigues me about your website is that you talk, you obviously talk about the business of architecture, but you, you talk a lot about um, what's appropriate sort of for an architect to be doing for his or her practice, small business, and maybe what's not. And, and I know we talked recently about should a, should a architect be doing their own bookkeeping, but it's the same thing when you're practicing law or you're practicing architecture or engineering. I think you have to say, you know, where do I add the value to this process? And where is it really fair for me to charge decent rates and be paid for what I do? And if there's administrative junk or technology junk that maybe you're not so swift at, it's got to go away. Like it's, that's better on everybody or, or business related junk like bookkeeping. It's got to go away. So we're seeing a real, I guess, um, efficiency of, of resources. That I think that is where technology brings us is that while we're, you know, we're reaping the benefits of it, so is everybody else. But you're not going to be able to use any kind of old fashioned excuse on your clients that, you know, I didn't have a form of contract like that already. Um, you know, I didn't. I I didn't really understand how to use the BIM when I sat down at it. You, you can't you can't say that anymore. So, if if clients are pushing back against the billing model, what are what are um, law firms turning to? Are there any other pricing models out there besides the billable hours? That yes, yes, we um, <laughs> we have something called alternative fee arrangements, which which uh, covers a wide basket of of different types of billing arrangements. Um, frankly, in my jaundiced, sarcastic mind, most of them still kind of go back to the billing hour. But examples of an alternative fee arrangement would be a contingency fee where you don't get paid at all. If you're seeking money, I mean, you see it with personal injury attorneys, but you're seeing it with more different types of attorneys. Um, you see it with employment law attorneys. If you, if you don't have success, then your client isn't charged at all, um, and you share in whatever the monetary award would be. Uh, you're seeing partial contingency arrangements where um, maybe you work at a reduced rate from your normal rates, and if there's success, however that's defined, you get uh, some kind of bonus fee. Uh, so you get your rates restored and maybe some more for your, uh, you know, for you riding along. Um, and if, if you don't have success, you don't get any more. Um, I mean, I'd say those are like the two, the two main types of things, contingencies. You see flat fees, um, firms that have a particular facility with the electronic billing, um, who have really realized early and begun to accumulate data and assess, um, how long it's taking them to manage a case. Uh, or prepare a contract, it, they can feel confident that they understand how how many hours it's taking them. Then they're they're you know fine with delivering goods to a client for a, a flat fee. There are a couple of pieces in lawyering that are difficult. One is you don't know if you're doing a contract who you're negotiating against. If it's someone very difficult, obviously it's going to be a more time consuming thing. Um, and if you in litigation, litigation is like a decision tree. You just don't know where the road's going to take you. But you certainly can flat fee for phase one, phase two, phase three as as litigation itself evolves. Um, I think those are those are really the main the main things at this point. Interesting. So let's jump into your your licensure. So the business sure. that your your most recent business you saw a need here. And yes. tell me about the value proposition, about the opportunity you see, and then how you've developed this opportunity into what you tell and what you have now and what you offer. Okay, that was a lot of questions. Sorry, uh, <laughs> we'll start with one. Let's start about okay. you seeing the opportunity and being inspired to start the business. So, business formations are pretty damn simple, as long as you're not a design professional um, or a couple of other licensed, like a. Um, <laughs> my son was helping me last summer, uh, doing some research. And I found out that if you're, um, a lottery vendor in some state, you actually need a license too. 
But if you if you need a license, um, things become very difficult. And uh, so what what I saw was two things. One is architects, engineers, land surveyors, landscape architects don't understand that they're different from other businesses and that there's a licensing component to their, not themselves, everyone understands that they have to be individually licensed as a design professional, but in many states, I think it's 26 or 27 now, the firm itself needs to be licensed. And that is not something that a lot of design professionals understand. They don't, um, it's not, there's not a course that covers this either in architecture school or in preparation for sitting for the license. And even if they hear it, I think you really need to be a practitioner for a while to start to figure out what a business is about and hear it again. So that was the first thing was the information just needs to get out there because without that correct firm licensure, there, um, there are a lot of firms in trouble, <laughs> to put it bluntly, um, with disciplinary actions, which range from fines to um, not being able to practice for a period of time, having the firm not be able to practice. Actually, if you are a firm in New York and you are not licensed appropriately, it's a class E felony here. It's unlicensed practice. Um, I haven't seen anyone tossed in jail, but felony is not a cool word and the implications of, of being charged with one are not good either. Um, the second thing about the service was to the degree that people do get licensing advice, it comes from law firms. Um, that's great to get licensing advice from law firms, but the actual process is not always a straight path. So if you're coming here to New York, for example, which is one of the two or three hardest states to get through the process, um, you, you can be doing what you think is very simple, but suddenly have a law firm bill of a few thousand dollars because there were multiple calls to the state education department. Um, there were multiple, multiple calls to the secretary of state's office. Documents had to be revised. So the idea was, why can't we just stay on top of all of the regulations of all of the states, make that the business, you know? make it expeditious and flat fee for clients. And so that that's what the, the business model is. Uh, I should tell you a story about, as I was forming this idea in my head, I was at a, a business meeting out of town with the head of a, a very solid uh, structural engineering firm. And he was leaving, he I came down one morning in the elevator with him and I said, where, where are you going? You have your suitcase. You never leave in the middle of these meetings we have together. He said, oh, Patty, I'm so embarrassed to tell you. Um, we are a Connecticut-based engineering firm, and we have a project in Rhode Island, and the laws changed in Rhode Island, and nobody told us, and we're not in compliance, and they've stopped the project we're working on. And he oh, said, I got to go goodness. straighten this out. Oh. And I... I rolled this over in my mind, and I, the first thing was, "Well, thank God it wasn't our law firm." Uh, <laughs> yeah. But the second thing, oh. the second thing was, you know what? It could have been our law firm because, you know, if somebody calls us one day and says, "Can you qualify me in Rhode Island?" We'll go and do that, and then everybody sort of forgets about it. And if nobody, nobody's on top of the, the, these le legislative rules in the fifty states, there is a there's a textbook for it, a legal textbook. By the time they do supplements, everything's out of date. So I thought, well, somebody should be doing this. <laughs> so, so that's what I'm doing. I mean, we're subscribing to every newsletter of every architecture board, I have you know alerts and research out everywhere. Anytime I sniff or smell a change about licensing in any state, the idea is to A, be on top of it for future clients, but also let current clients know, hey, Something changed. You need to do something. Don't whatever you do. Don't have your. Don't be blamed for delay of a project. I mean, that's going to be a bummer. So, well, it sounds it sounds like the perfect you know what is I don't know Mastercard or Visa commercial where if you you have a great value proposition because right what's what's the value of being able not to have to stop a meeting to go you know go figure out why your project is stopped in a neighboring state 
I mean, what is the true value of that? I mean, that's truly priceless. Well, that's it. I mean, this is such a little, st- I mean, I shouldn't say stupid, but it's a stupid ministerial thing. And you start to think about the implications for people and you start to think about, you know, somebody's charged with a felony in New York for doing this and somebody else, you know, has, has be- becomes blamed for a uh, project delay. You know, the, the monetary implications of this are enormous. And uh, as I said, you know, but, well, I didn't say it, but because we're America and we have 50 states, why would the laws be the same in every state? Because that would be easy. They're not. And um, an example of that is Nevada. Nevada has a um, architecture design professional. Their boards are supported, I understand, mostly by the fines that they're able to impose. And they have a very rigid rule that you can't even hand out a business card in that state if you're associated with a firm, and that firm is not licensed in Nevada. So I'm not even talking about answering an RFP. I'm talking about shaking someone's hand and giving them a business card. And I think as a firm, but just anecdotally, I have heard of so many people who have been fined in Nevada for not complying with their rules and kind of shrugging and say, okay, it's a cost of doing business. You know, we got the project, thank goodness. And that, you know, covered the fine. But, um, you know, that's Nevada. New York is, it's crazy place is about the name of your firm. And it has very, very rigid and uh, what would seemingly be strange rules to people about what, what name their firm can be. So there are give, different give me an example of the name. Just what is what's that? Okay. All about? Um, New York uh, has has a rule that they do not want uh, your entity, your your professional entity to in any way be confused with a non-professional entity. So a problem that we come up against frequently um, and a non-professional entity is de- defined as any entity that doesn't meet New York's licensing requirements, which means basically not almost totally owned by New York licensed architects. So if we have a client in New Jersey called Jones and Smith Architecture Firm in New Jersey, and they say, oh, we need to be qualified in New York, New York will not let you be Jones and Smith because they're deeming the architecture firm in New Jersey to be a non-professional entity according to the rules of New York. So you end up, you know, being J and S Architecture New York, um, you know, some something completely different. Uh, New Jersey architects who practice in New York, PC, you know, whatever it is. But that's an example. New York is one of the states that requires the profession to be in the name of of the entity. That's not true of all. Um, if you're using names that are not the names of the owners, they um, they require explanation letters uh, about why that is and why you're choosing your name. And then, of course, that becomes a subjective decision about whether they'll approve it. I had a fight with a client a couple of months ago. He wanted the word architects in his New York design professional corporation. And I said, well, you're the only licensed owner. There's one non-licensed owner. They're never going to let the architects, they're never going to let the S through. Mm. Mm. (laughs) We had it. finally, you know, we just went on. I said, he said, well, I have employees, so I have licensed <laughs> architects. I said, I'm telling you, they're not going to let the the S through. Wow. And sure enough, you know, he said, could you please submit it? I said, of course, I'll submit it. It's just time. And um, so three or four weeks later, later, we got the ding letter saying, one owner, no S. <laughs> so, you know, that's a, that's a big hurdle for New York. Oh, Patty, I'm sure people are just scratching their heads right now. Everyone listening has stopped the car and they're thinking, they're thinking WTF, you know, they're like, Sam, what have we come to? There are people who are paid to do this every day, four or five of them in the state of New York. Oh my goodness. Wow. <laughs> and, and countless throughout the U.S. So. Yeah, yeah. And they're probably thinking, I'm so glad I'm an architect and not an attorney. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully I so. mean, you know, we're, we're laughing about this and some days I definitely come to work and ask myself what I, what I was thinking of because I'm just dealing with, you know, absurdities. 
But I, I want to make a serious comment and say that um, I think that the design professional boards in each state um, understand their mission. And their mission is that people who contribute to the built environment are responsible for the lives and safety of everyone who uses those those buildings or spaces. And it is very important to the states and it is a province of the states to make sure that the people who are working in their state know what they're doing and to make sure that the public isn't somehow deceived, which is where all this naming stuff comes from. Um, so as much as I can sit here all day and tell you crazy stories, I think that their hearts and minds are in the right place. Um, it's, it's very important. It's very important. I mean, I sit here obviously in the urban landscape um, where we have construction accidents happen a few times a year, whether a crane collapses or, um, you know, parts of a, some kind of a barrier or wall go blowing around. And invariably, because we all live so close together, um, somebody gets hurt whenever anything untoward happens. So I guess at the end of the day, we have to just say, I get it. I get it. People are doing their best to make sure because these jobs are just really, really important. And that, that's a great reminder. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't, I don't want to make light of, of what they're doing. What they're doing is, is very important. Exactly. And I think the same thing in, in architecture too, we, we experience, you know, a lot of the codes we look at them, we just scratch our head and we think, how did this ever happen? But it is good to remember the, you know, what's behind it all and what we're going for here. So Patty, yes. in terms of the licensure of a firm, uh, you know, this may, like you said, this is probably new to a lot of architects. I know I've heard yeah. of it before. I'm, I'm definitely not an expert in it. Could you describe to us a little bit what it actually means to have the actual firm, the entity itself to have a license? Sure. So looking at small firms, we have people who practice as sole proprietors. They are not entities. So just to define that term, when I say entity, it means that uh, you're some kind of incorporated firm. You might be a professional corporation. You might be a limited liability company, a professional limited liability company. You might, you might even be an inc, which is allowed in a few of the states, but not all of them. And the reason people typically do that is to limit their, li their business liabilities. And um, just, uh, just giving you sort of the corporate one, two, three here on this. Um, so if you maybe have a lease, um, if you maybe have a bank loan and you're lucky enough not to have a personal guarantee, you might want to create some kind of entity so that um, if something terrible happens, you won't be personally charged with those types of business liabilities. A sole proprietor is taking all those on as an individual. And then I also want to say very clearly, whether you're a sole proprietor or, or you're a business firm, um, it is very, very important to make sure that you have adequate insurance for both your professional liability as well as whatever business insurance you require to keep yourself safe and protected. Um, so we get to the place where you have an entity and um, typically you'll find that professional firms are, are one of four types. The professional, as I just said, professional corp, the limited liability corp. Um, some some firms operate as partnerships, although that's not terrifically popular any longer. Um, and some are allowed to be inks, meaning like a regular corporation. Uh, those decisions are often made uh, with accountants, what type of entity you are. Um, it's often a tax-driven reason. Here in New York, uh, we can always sort of get around the the tax issues and make any entity as tax friendly as we can. Um, but for our smaller clients, what's, what really drives it is formation costs. So I don't mean my fee, but the state costs. The state costs, for example, um, a limited liability, professional limited liability partnership and a professional limited liability company in New York have what they call a publication requirement, meaning you need to put notice of your formation into a newspaper for six weeks. 
And if you're here in New York County, which is Manhattan, um, the county clerk assigns you the newspapers. You have no, no choice over what they are. And the cost of that publication alone can run $1,200 to $1,500. So that's enough to force a lot of people into the corporate form, which would be the professional corporation or a specific type of um, entity we have here in New York called the Design Professional Corporation. Um, so once you, you now are practicing, you now have a firm, and you're practicing in a state, everything's great. The rub comes when you get when you're here in New York and you get the call from somebody in New Jersey and they say, hey, I have a project for you. OK, the laws of each state say if you are doing a project in their states and this has to do again with the practice, it's, it's nothing, it's not the business laws, it's the architecture, the engineering regulations. If you are practicing in this state and you are a firm, and you are the architect of record, you need to tell us you're here. So this is where the difficulties start to mount up. Um, in some states, you just need to tell the Secretary of State, like, like my business or a shoemaker's business. You just qualify, it's a qualify to do business as a foreign corporation or a foreign entity in that state. You just do a little filing with the Secretary of State. Uh, they just want to know so that you'll pay them an annual fee. And if they're really lucky, you'll have to pay them some income taxes. As I said, there are 26 or 27 states where the there's a, a, a regulatory board, the Board of Architecture, the Board of Engineering, sometimes it's one board for all the licensed professions, as it is here, the New York State Education Department. And they want you to show up. And oftentimes that process is one direction or the other. Here in New York, you show up at the state education department, you have to present everyone's license and show that the licenses of the owners comply with whatever the requirements are for the specific entity. Then they approve that the corporation can be formed. Now you head over to the Secretary of State and you form um, the business. And then you got to go back again to the state education department and say, here are the certified papers showing that we formed the business. And now you're listed in the roster of approved entities for the New York State Education Department. Most states, you go to the Secretary of State first, you form your, your entity, and then you go to the board and you present all of the appropriate individual licenses. So that is a significant hurdle that I think architects don't realize and engineers that um, once you're hired for a project in another state you need to look at the rules of that state and make sure that your your business entity is compliant the second problem is um, I'll give you an example of this is that some states recognize certain entity forms and other states don't so we have a, a solo practitioner, um, a solo owner, I'm sorry, he's not a solo practitioner, he's a single owner, and he owns a corporation in California. California, interestingly, is one of the less um, difficult states to get through, uh, which you wouldn't think, because there's a lot of building and you've got seismic and everything in California, but, but it is um, on this stuff. So he's a regular company, his, the name of his company includes the word company in it in California, and he came here one day and he said, uh, I work for um, a designer, uh, or, or athletic shoe company, and they're opening um, some branches here on the East Coast, and uh, they wanted me to open an outpost here on the East Coast because they're, they're, an op uh, they're an, a company that's from abroad, and they just didn't want a guy from California working on the East Coast. So I'm going to like lease some space in Brooklyn. I said, okay, great. Now you're going to have to uh, register your firm here. Well, I'm a company. Well, New York's not going to accept that. New York does not allow, uh, except in some very limited instances, which I don't want to go into for big firms, uh, New York does not allow the, the ink. And the reason for that is because Ownership interests in a corporation can just go back and forth. I can sell mine to you. You can sell yours to mine. And they kind of lose track of who's licensed and who's not. So they, they don't allow that here. 
So what we had to do for him is not qualify the California entity. That's its own thing in California. We had to set up a whole separate new entity here in New York that would comply with the laws and requirements of this state. So you have, you know, first people need to be aware that they need to look into these rules, but then they need to be prepared that their existing entity may or may not meet the requirements of the new state. And that is regardless of whether or not I'm personally licensed in the state. The entity has nothing to do with whether you're personally licensed in this state, but I assure you that every single regulatory board's form will force you to designate what they call a responsible architect in charge in that state, and that person must be a licensee of that state. Sometimes, some states require the responsible architect in charge to be an owner, officer, or director, and some don't. Some just require a full-time employee. Interesting. So if, uh, let's just say, for instance, I'm a California, let's take a hypothetical example, uh, California company here, uh, get a project in New York, I want to go in there. Let's say I already have a license. I'm licensed architect in, uh, or let's, let's say I'm not, I guess, and I want to form up that corporation. Does that then mean that I need to find an architect locally who can be that architect designated? In New York, um, as I said, one of the stricter states, uh, the most giving we could be to you <laughs> is this Design Professional Service Corporation, which says that 75.01% of the ownership must reside with a licensed professional. So what? So since you're not, and, and that means New York licensed. Um, so since you are not New York licensed, in this case, you would have to find a partner to uh, take over 75, who's New York licensed, to be a 75.01% owner of your business, or you would have to end carbon into New York. Um, and then you could you could be that, but New York's New York wants a really strong New York presence in its ownership. So I mean, we have a lot of clients who do that. They, you know, they need to get into a specific state, and then you know, they we we tell them what the requirements are, and they say, okay, I'm going to need to get the NCARB certification, um, and and deal with it like that. I have a, a, there's another example. Um, of a small firm who we're helping who need to get into three states. Um, both of the owners of the original firm are licensed architects. Unfortunately, one is licensed outside of this country and one is licensed in this country. And um, the three states they need to get into are Ohio, New York, and New Jersey. And um, in this case, I, I the laws of Ohio were not clear to me. I called them. I said, I've got, um, I've got a firm that's owned by two people, and one of them is, can certainly end carbon and get his Ohio license, and the other guy is uh, not licensed in the States. Is, is that enough for you guys? Can, can we now go in and qualify this firm to do business in, uh, in Ohio? And they're like, oh, yeah, come on down. New York says, absolutely not. We're not going to recognize the guy who is, um, is not licensed in New York, not licensed in the States. So you're going to have to create a whole new entity, this design professional, where their ownership will be uneven and comply with the laws of New York. New Jersey, <laughs> New Jersey is like filled with sopranos. They're like, I don't know. We're not going to tell you over the phone. Just submit the papers and we'll decide then. <laughs> so um, they said, you know, they didn't have any particular written rules, but it would kind of depend on what they felt like that day. Um, so we have no idea whether this, whether this, you know, original firm will be qualified to do business in New Jersey, or if we'll have to do the same thing we're doing in New York, which is sort of reconstitute it somehow to meet the New Jersey laws. So, so, so I guess what the question is: What is the the day when everyone's feeling great in New Jersey? <laughs> I haven't found that day. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture to get more resources about how you as an architect can run a rewarding business that is both fun flexible and profitable visit businessofarchitecture.com 
and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use Internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. Views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.